This is Superior Sports Talk with Reggie Wilson and Luke Inman, part of Locked On Sports Minnesota, and it starts now. Back in the lab, Reggie and Luke back at it. Another episode of Superior Sports Talk presented by Locked On Sports Minnesota. Haven't seen you in a while. What's happening, Reggie? I know. It's it's like it's like you do exist still. Oh my goodness. <laughs> it's like outside <laughs> of this realm, Reggie still exists. So oh my goodness. No, uh great, great weekend. Um it was uh, you know, pretty chill weekend. Kind of a kind of a long one. Um, we didn't have the podcast yesterday, but mm-hmm. I was still on TV yesterday. So saw that. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So look, we 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 just back rolling, baby. We doing it. Yeah, long weekend means we got plenty to catch up on. I mean, including four Twins games to look back at. Vikings OTAs picking back up today. Plus later, I'm putting Reggie on the hot seat with what does it mean. It's all coming up on Superior Sports Talk. But first, if you enjoy Superior Sports Talk, you'll also enjoy our other daily show with former NFL receiver Ron Johnson. Ron offers the unique view of an athlete-turned-broadcaster and brings you high-profile guests like Braylon Edwards, Adam Thielen, and Robert Smith. Subscribe to Locked On Sports Minnesota YouTube channel or your favorite podcast feeds so you never miss an episode. All right, well, let's talk about those twins, shall we? Twins went two and two since we last spoke. They've lost three of their last five. Here's your quick recap. They win 10-7 Friday versus the Royals. Luis Arise, two for five, no big deal. Twins use eight pitchers, but get the win. Saturday, Buxton returns after a few days off. Chris Archer allows three runs through just four innings. Twins lose that one 7-3. Luis Arise, three for five, no big deal. Sunday, <laughs> Twins win their final of four with the Royals split the series two games apiece with a win seven to three. Sonny Gray just one earn through six. That was enough for the Twins. Buxton and Correa combined just one of eight. No worries though. Luis Arise two for four. And finally, <laughs> yesterday, Twins start their first of four with the Tigers on the road. Dylan Bundy gets chopped up a little bit. Nine hits, four earned through six innings. Gave the Twins a chance, though, heading into the seventh, but some uncharacteristic, costly defensive errors for the Twins cost them this one. They lose 7-5. to five. There's your 32nd Memorial Weekend Twins recap, Reggie. Twins hitting a little funk right now with some costly injuries mounting up. Maybe the biggest news of all was Royce Lewis being called back up, but just a few innings into his big return, he has to leave with a knee injury after crashing into that center field wall. He goes on the 10-day IL with Jose Miranda coming right back up. Sonny Gray was also hurt during Sunday's start. He's likely to hit the 15-day IL. And on top of that, Celestino, Joe Ryan, and now Carlos Correa all on the COVID exempt list. Your thoughts and takeaways from weekend's play and the Twins just mess in the injury department right now. It's like that. Uh, it's like that Christmas song and a partridge and a pear tree. It's just like, goodness gracious! Like they can't catch a break right now. You know, it was it was interesting because you know they were getting healthy. You know, Correa came back, and the the lineup was pretty much stat. Like mm. it's pretty chalk. Like for a bit, you know, Sonny Gray came back. He's pitching lights out. You know, and all of a sudden you're just like, okay, all right, we we see what they can do. They got it cooking a little bit. Then all of a sudden, all these you know injuries happen. You know, Joe Ryan, then Celestino, and then you know now Sonny. And it was kind of crazy because fans have been clamoring, demanding that Royce Lewis come back, and they <laughs> finally made the move because Miranda really wasn't producing in the way that you know, kind of justified keeping him up. And so they sent Royce Lewis down. They were like, look, you know, if we got Correa, we got, you know, all these guys in place. We need to find another place for Royce to play. So they had him down in in AAA, and they were just like, all right, let's play musical Royce. (laughs) We're going to put him – at third today, we're going to put him at second today. We're going to put him in the outfield today. 
And it was just a matter of getting him comfortable at playing those multiple positions. And then they finally brought him back up and they put him in center field. And then he goes all Byron Buxton and goes crashing into the wall and hurts himself. And you're just like, really? Really? And it, it looked like much more serious than I guess it turned out to be because you were just like, <gasps> you know, gasping. That's that same knee that he tore, you know, just a year ago, tore the ACL in that knee. And so you're just like, oh, no. Reggie Miller, no, he no. didn't. No, he didn't. And you're just like, man, like, how tough is that? Like, mm. you finally mm. get him back. Fans are all excited because he finally got caught. The twins finally listened to us, they said. And then just so unfortunate to go out there and get hurt. And now, like, you got these mounting injuries and – you know, they've lost three of five. They they split two and two in a series they should have won. We keep talking about that. And, you know, they're in another series that they should win, but they dropped the first game. And you're just like, dang, man, like this was not the right time for this stuff to happen because you got series coming up against teams that are going to be tough to beat. And now you're not going to have your full arsenal at your disposal either. Like it's a little concerning. Oh, no doubt. I mean, we talked about this soft stretch in the schedule for weeks leading Not up. Not soft anymore. All of a sudden, I mean, they needed to take advantage of this, and they just haven't played to the level of our expectations during the stretch thus far. Yesterday, again, with some costly defensive errors, we're just not used to seeing. And now you talk about these injuries piling up. Could mm -hmm. not come at a worse time with their first real litmus test on the horizon since the Houston Astros about three weeks ago when they played the Toronto Blue Jays mm -hmm. without, as of now, a handful of their best players. Luis yeah. Rice, though, a gaudy 360 <laughs> batting average. Good gravy. Should this man be leading off? I mean, enough is enough here, right? I mean, I know Buxton has to be the leadoff guy, but Luis Rice, my goodness, he's making a strong push for that leadoff spot. You always put your most effective guy mm -hmm. in that leadoff spot mm -hmm. because they can just kind of set the tone, get on base, and kind of just get things started. You know, the, the hope is that they get on base and then they end up at home plate mm. with a couple hitters later. And so when Buxton is not playing – I think Buxton makes the most sense, you mm -hmm. know. You know, maybe it, it – there may be some some thought to putting Buxton third in the lineup, cleanup mm -hmm. in the mm -hmm. lineup, you know. Maybe – Switch maybe it Maybe with his production, mm -hmm. yeah, you do that. But, you know, I think when Buxton is healthy and when Buxton is in the lineup, you bat him lead off mm -hmm. because he's the ultimate tone setter on that team. But on games where he's not playing or just to switch it up a little bit, just to, you know, kind of – mix it up, you know, just to do something a little different. I think it would be cool to put a rise at, at that leadoff spot and, and just kind of see what he can do. The guy, if anything, he's productive. And so why not put one of your most productive hitters at that leadoff spot and watch him work? I never thought we would be having this conversation <laughs> two months ago. I mean, no, but Buxton poses such a threat out of the box, a number down the line, a bun, being able to beat out some routine ground balls, and then poses such a threat, obviously, on the base pass as well from there. But yeah, what Luis Arise has been, just been doing these past three, four weeks is just really fun to watch, no doubt. And quietly, yeah. quietly, too, Byron Buxton has seen his average dip. Ooh, it's been icy. 203. Yeah, not great. Not yeah. great, Bob. ESPN's latest article pulled a handful of MLB experts and asked who was the most surprising team through the first two full months of the season. Three of the four experts mentioned the Twins. Mm -hmm. One highlighted their core talent hitting like Buxton, Correa, Luis Arise, and another mentioned their overperforming pitching that ranks the top five in multiple categories and has even gone eight starters deep, proving their depth no one really knew they had. Mm -hmm. Your quick thoughts on the article and, and and the more impressive facet of the team thus far the pitching or the hitting it has to be the pitching yeah because we've seen it you know like even just over the last series and over the last you know few days like the pitching is kind of getting roughed up a little bit you know Tyler Duffy you know Rocco Baldelli talked about how much he still believes in him and how he's still going to continue to put him in in high leverage situations even though you know 
he just continues to struggle in those areas. But but the pitching has also shown some flashes, you mm-hmm. know, Sonny Gray, mm-hmm. Joe Ryan, shoot, Devin Smelter, who's, yeah. who's going to pitch today. Like, he's been really good um, over the last few starts that he's had. Like, there have been some times where you look at the pitching and you're just like, all right, here we go. And, you know, we always go back to it. But, you know, coming out, the Twins were like, look, we got championship expectations for this team. And it's just like, all right, whatever you say, guys. And, you know, the hope was just (laughs) that they were going to – yeah, the hope was that they were just going to, you know, beat teams with the bat. Like they were just going to hit you all over the field, hit you like crazy. But, you know, at certain times – the bats have not shown up, and the pitching has. And it's, it's been interesting to see. Um, and now, you know, as they sit nine games over 500, I will put them exactly where where the article puts them because I don't think any – you know, I think the, the optimism was that they would be where they are right now. But I think, you know, the realist in us were just like, oh, I don't know. I'm not really sure that pitching kind of concerns me, man. I don't know if they're going to be able to keep up with the bats. And there have been just ebbs and flows through this thing where sometimes the bats have been just lights out nonstop. And then sometimes the pitching has been lights out nonstop. I think the tough part is projecting this over the rest of the season. I don't really know what to expect. What did we say? The first week of the show, first week of the season, smash the over. I mean, there's Mm -hmm. no way this pitching staff is going to be able to chew up a bunch of innings and come in and close games. But this lineup, man, they should go off night in and night out. That really hasn't been the case consistently by any means. Now, every fourth or fifth game, twins go off for double digits. But more times than not, it has been the pitching really saving this team. And when you look at it on paper, you say there's no way the strength of this team can be the pitching. But you look at the mm-hmm. stats, you look at multiple categories, top five in ERA, top five in multiple positions in pitching. And I think fans are just collectively holding their breath saying, when is it going to come back down to earth? But when are yeah. the bats going to start to consistently light up like we're used to seeing? That we saw a little bit last year as well. Noon game Game today, first pitch, 12-10. You mentioned it. Devin Smeltzer returning to the mound after a great seven-inning outing his last time out. 80 pitches thrown. We'll see how he can follow that up. Rest assured, Reggie and I will be back here tomorrow to break it all down. All right, coming up, we're talking about the Vikings offseason. And later, I'm putting Reggie on the hot seat with what does it mean. But first, if you want instant post-game reaction from insiders that cover your favorite teams, check out our Locked On Sports Minnesota podcast on YouTube or wherever you get your podcasts. Podcasts. Following every Twins, Vikings, Wild, or Wolves game, our Locked On team hosts are broadcasting live with team insiders like Kevin Gorg for the Wild and Brandon Warren for the Twins. Never miss a podcast by subscribing to Locked On Sports Minnesota YouTube channel. Okay, well, Reggie, the Vikings' final stretch of practice at OTAs commences today. It wraps up June 3rd, then a few days off until veteran mandatory mini camp, June 7th to the 9th. I know you've been out to a few of these practices, and something I haven't heard a lot about that I'm just a little curious is the backup quarterback battle right now. We all know Sean Mannion returns as the clipboard king, a proven veteran (laughs) in the league, there to help Kirk Cousins, really, and if you need him in a pinch. But we also know the Vikings used a third-round pick last year on Kellen Mann, a kid who lit it up under Jimbo Fisher. So he comes from a pro-style offense. He was a threat with his arm and his legs at Texas A&M and versus some of the best competition in the country he was named senior bowl MVP down in Mobile Alabama's all-star game so I know Mike Zimmer kind of called him out to the media last year said he's nowhere near ready last season as a rookie but now he's got a year under his belt full off season he's with Kevin O'Connell teaching him a new system I'm just wondering how close do you think this quarterback battle is for the backup job from what you've seen so far how do both these guys look so far when you've been out there I think it's close it's interesting um when I was out there last week it was interesting to see both of those guys just kind of getting some work in after the session was over Mm. you know Mannion was just taking some time to put some extra throws in you know throwing it to the net throwing to some of the the equipment guys um and then you know Kellen Mond was out there 
really getting after it uh, with, you know, some of the coaches and some some supporting players were out there, you know, helping them out, catching some passes from them. And, you know, the coaching staff so far has been pretty complimentary of Kellen after, you know, seeing him out there for a couple of weeks. And so I think, you know, the upside for Kellen Mond is much more. I think at this point, you know what you're going to get from Sean Mannion. You know, that game against Green Bay when Cousins was out and they needed that, and that was the performance they got from Sean Mannion, that was rough. That was kind of brutal to watch. And I think at this point, you know what you're going to get from Sean Mannion. He's a veteran. He, you know, is going to know the offense, you know, front and back, kind of like an extension of the coach out there. But just as far as like being able to get this team in position to actually win football games, I'm not really sure that he's the guy for that. Mm. But when it comes to Kellen Mond, the upside is great. You know, I think one of the biggest things about him, you know, he played in that pro style offense with Jimbo Fisher, but you know, I think the the book coming out on him was, can he be accurate enough at the NFL level? Can he be consistent enough to actually will a team to win a football game, to make plays? You know, he's athletic. He's going to be able to kind of move around out there. He gives you a little bit something different than Kirk Cousins does. But the the issue is, is how much can he mature? How much can he improve at the NFL level, and it was tough to see Mike Zimmer really just kind of poo-poo on him last yeah. year, really just didn't give him a chance, really really didn't even, like, I, I don't know, like, I, I was not with the, the open bashing that he did of Kellen Mond, like, that couldn't have done good things for his confidence, and now you see a little bit more of a pep in his step, you know, with this new coaching staff who are giving him a chance and and want to see what he can do. And I think you're kind of seeing him respond to that early on. And so I'm interested to see how he battles in training camp and really just kind of pushes Sean Mannion for that backup spot. But I think it's going to be interesting to see. I don't know much, but I do know this. After watching Mannion versus the Packers, like you said, in Lambeau last year, lose 37 to 10. In fact, not score a touchdown, by the way, until they were down 30 to nothing deep yeah, in the third that was quarter. I, just, I promise you a lot of fans are thinking no way Mon can be you know, any worse than that performance if that's right. the competition. So right. there's going to be a lot of eyes on that backup battle throughout the rest of OTAs and, of course, training camp starting in just a handful of weeks. I think the big thing that you highlighted, it's a new system, a, a pass-happy system quarterback friendly working with Kevin O'Connell this is the fresh start Mm -hmm. a young quarterback draft in the third round needed so all eyes will be on Mon for sure in that backup competition okay so ESPN's Bill Barnwell Mm -hmm. ranked every NFL team's offseason from worst to first the Vikings landed smack dab near the middle at 17 and Barnwell had some interesting things to say about Quasey's first offseason as GM noting the solid addition of Jordan Hicks on the cheap Harrison Phillips so Darius Smith, of course, retaining core guys. We know Daniil Hunter, Patrick Peterson. When it came to the draft, mixed reviews saying the good news was it did seem they added three instant starters, Lewis Seen, Andrew Booth Jr., and, of course, Ed Engram. But he wasn't huge on trading with division, specifically handing gifting the Packers and Aaron Rodgers, Christian Watson in the second round. The biggest criticism, though, came in these two aspects. One, he didn't love the contract extension to Kirk Cousins and more so the layup of the deal and two just in a broader sense it it never felt like Quasey had a good feel of direction of where he wanted to take this team he didn't commit to either winning now and going all in with some key aging veterans like Harrison Smith Kendricks Thielen Cousins etc but yet he didn't really go full rebuild and tear the whole thing down instead taking more years and kicking the can down the road on those same veterans, a Thielen, Cousins, Harrison Smith contract extension. So all in all, Reggie, they rank 17, not the end of the world, kind of again, smack dab in the middle. In comparison, even the Lions rank 27th, the Bears rank 23rd. So could be worse. Uh, agree or disagree, though, with Barnwell's rankings and just your overall thoughts on the article? It's tough because, you know, um, 
I, I guess Kwesi kind of characterized it as a competitive rebuild. Yeah, right. Like they're they're, right. be, they're simultaneously building for the present and the future, which is just like I don't know if you can do both, you know. But I think what was tough was the situation that Kwesi was handed over, and you know I think you saw what his thought process was when you got to the draft, like him trying to give value, him trying to get as much as possible to kind of help fill out the depth of the team and kind of help, you know, mold the team into a younger direction, starting with the draft. But I think it was tough kind of taking over when he did because he had a lot of decisions to make that really weren't going to help the Vikings right away. And so I think what he decided was, okay, well, you know, since we kind of are tied to a lot of these players already, how about we we just go ahead and just kind of go all in and see what we can get out of this season? And then I think maybe after this upcoming season, that's when you maybe evaluate like, OK, do we want to keep this band together or do we want to blow it up? And I think, you know, a lot of fans were like, look, we've seen, you know, this team max out with the guys that that are there already blow it up and start fresh and and build something new build another type of a bully and I think what's tough about that is Kwesi is just like well maybe with a new regime maybe with you know some different coaching and a different culture maybe we can pull a little bit more out of these players than was being pulled in the previous coaching staff and so I think really what this shows is that their confidence in themselves and being able to do it. And, and quite honestly, like looking at what the, the team has done, I think it it really inspires a lot of confidence from, you know, position by position standpoint that they can actually do something. You mentioned you know, getting guys that are instant starters like Seen and Booth. And then on the other side with Ingram. And then you mix in some of the new guys with some of the guys who were already there. And you're like, huh, this might be a pretty good football team. And so I think what you saw was Kwesi turn something that could have been a negative into a positive. Because, okay, say you move on from Daniil Hunter. Say you try to move on from uh, Kirk Cousins. You know, you're going to have all this dead money on the cap now. And now also you aren't going to have those players. So, like, the team is not going to be all that good. And I think the decision was made like, okay, well, since we are tied to some of these players, let's try to get the most out of them. You know, Daniil Hunter was not extended, you know, as he comes back from this injury. I think that's pretty telling. Mm -hmm. So they're going to let him play out the deal, you know, for – what we've seen so far, things could change. You know, they could see him in training camp and be like, oh, yeah, we want to re-sign him to a long-term deal. But they didn't do that for him. You know, they signed, you know, Zadarius Smith. I think when it was looked at, the contract, like, as a whole, it was one that they could get out of, you know, mm -hmm. immediately if they, you know, don't work out with the, you know, with the, the signing. Mm -hmm. And so I think what is interesting is, is like you've got, you know, you, you kick the can on Kirk Cousins down, you know, another year. And I think, you know, there's going to be a situation where you can kind of get out of that as well um, in the near future. And I think what's been interesting is, you know, they've been smart with some of these deals that they've made that, you know, allows them to maybe go full rebuild if it doesn't work out. But I think all that we've seen and all of the energy that is around this team and with the coaching staff and the new regime, I do believe that they feel that they have some pieces in place to actually contend this year. And I'm interested to see how far they can take it. To most people, Quase is the boss. He's the GM. He, he's the guy you look up to and you got to answer to. But people forget, quasi has got a boss too. And Mark and Ziggy Wilf, the owners, saw all those close games last year. Yep. How many? 10, 11, 12, down to the wire, one score games. And yep. yeah, they, they beat the Panthers and maybe another one in there, but 
for the most part, the Vikings just – the ball did not bounce their way in the majority of those games, but they yeah. were competitive. And I think Mark and Ziggy will – had an asterisk by the the hiring of, of Kwesi and said, listen, you're going to get the job. It's all yours. It's your team to run. But – there's too much potential here. There's too much of a core foundation, a nucleus of great talent. And I'm not going to give you the okay, the green light to do full rebuild. So Quasi yep. took that for what it was worth, obviously. And I tend to agree with them, to be honest, because again, you yeah. look at all the one score games and there is a great tight core nucleus of, of young, but a mix of veteran talent as well. Obviously, uh, so much of this game comes down to the quarterback, but how many elite elite quarterbacks are out there seven right, maybe right. so i mean you got 23 25 other teams trying to consistently find that good quarterback play kirk cousins obviously in the top upper half of the nfl quarterback so that's bill barnwell's at least take on the vikings offseason teams 32 through 17 i believe were released first so the rest is coming out this week no packers on the list so they're obviously in the upper half according to barnwell we'll check on that later in the week all right the time has come my favorite segments here i'm putting reggie on the hot seat covering all the latest hot topics with what does it mean first up espn's latest article begs the question what each mlb team's chances would look like if they traded for nationals 23 year old stud juan soto the article notes soto to the twins could catapult the twins from could be to would be in regards to playoff contention what would it mean for the Twins as far as fair compensation for Soto? And if it came down to it and, you know, the Twins were actually involved in a blockbuster deal, would you rather have another big bat in the lineup or a starting pitching ace come July or August? What's your opinion on that? I think you go pitching. I think you have to. Yeah. I don't think we I, need another bat in the yeah, lineup, do we? I don't, I don't know. You know, coming into this season, and we just talked about it in the first segment, like the bats were supposed to be like their bread and butter. Right. And so, you know, you added Correa, and then now that almost seems like a luxury with how well Royce Lewis was playing before the injury. And you're just like, dang, like these dudes have some some things going. You know, you, you would hope that Miranda turns it around and continues to develop, you know, as he grows in his career. And you got some of these guys, you know, coming up from AAA, and then you got the bats that are currently in place, and you're just like, man, yeah, they're, they're looking good, yeah. Good. And I don't know that adding a Juan Soto is absolutely necessary. I mean, is it fun? Yeah, yeah, it, yeah, it would be fun. But when you talk about what you would probably have to give up right. to get a guy like right. that, I don't know that the the risk outweighs the reward there because it's just like man like you're probably talking about giving up some guys who are you know difference makers right now and some prospects who are going to be difference makers in the future and I don't know that you leverage the future on a guy like Soto and then now you're also talking about probably you know paying you know most of your payroll to that guy because he's going to command two three hundred you know, million dollars in a contract. And so you're, you're looking at that and you're like, Shh. like they just gave big money to Byron Buxton and their idea of big money was a hundred mil, right. you know, like right. not two and right. 300 mil. <laughs> so it's just like, no, you, you much rather see them go all in on a starting caliber pitcher, which would also cost them a lot if they decided to swing a, a blockbuster trade for that. You're going to have to give up some good prospects and and some good pieces for that as well. And so I think, you know, you get Kenta Maeda back and, you know, you're going to get Chris Paddock back. I think you kind of stand pat with who you got and just allow the guys that are on the team already to continually develop. But, I mean, Juan Soto would be fun or whatever. Yeah, know. of course. You know, if we're playing MLB The Show right now, this ain't a yeah. video game, though. You know, I I'm just saying, I'm not a baseball expert, Reggie, but I've watched enough baseball over the last 15, 20 years to know if you're going to make a big move towards the end and make a push for the playoffs, it's got to be for a stud pitcher. We know... In all of sports, quarterback may be the most important position. Pitching is the second most important. And when you can go out and win game one of a playoff series with that stud pitcher, mm -hmm. such a huge advantage. And you see it every year in the postseason. If they're going to make a big move, as much as Soto would be fun and exciting, and of course, sell tickets 
I hope it's for a pitcher once that time comes. We'll see how all that shakes out once we get more of the thick of the summer and see where the Twins are at in the actual playoff standings and AL Central Division. Next one up, the NBA Finals matchup is officially set as the Golden State Warriors and Boston Celtics remain as the last two team standings. With Golden State, the heavy favorites in Vegas coming off a full week of rest and the Celtics just grinding out a full seven-game series with the Heat, What does it mean for the Celtics' chances to upset the Warriors for the NBA championship? You think this one goes deep, six, seven games? You you giving the Celtics a chance here? Or Warriors just clearly, cleanly look like the better team right now? I mean, you know, they're a professional basketball team who went through Brooklyn, who Mm -hmm. went through uh, Giannis, Mm -hmm. who went through Jimmy. And I think you're like, wow, like this team is battle tested. Like they can they can hang with anyone. And I think that is what you think. And that is what you believe after watching them do what they do. That being said, like they've had some battles, man. And, you know, I know they are relatively young, so they'll be able to, you know, weather this. But like all of that kind of takes its toll on a team. And the Warriors have just kind of been sitting back like, man, we chilling. You know, we we feeling good. And what I think is interesting is is how efficient Golden State is. Mm-hmm. And I think you put that against what the Celtics have been, which was inefficient at times. You know, there have been times where, you know, they, they go into maybe the fourth quarter with the lead and you're just like, man, look, if the other team gets hot, they're going to steamroll them, and I don't think the Celtics are going to have an answer. And I think that's kind of been what you are looking at when it comes to this series. And so I think that Golden State is going to win this series. You know, I think initially I was just like, oh, yeah, they're going to pack them up and and send them home with Samsonite. Like, they're out of here, you know. They're gone. But I think I think this probably will go at least six games because you have to give Boston the benefit – like Udoka has been coaching his tail off Mm -hmm. this whole playoffs. And I think he's going to get those guys in position to win at least a couple games in this series. But I think the Warriors are going to be a little bit too much for them. Like when you got, you know, Steph and clay and pool hitting these shots and then you got size and length, you know, with the rebounding with Looney with Draymond green and his defensive prowess You know, I think that's going to be very tough for Boston to overcome. And I think I think I give this series to to Golden State. On January 6th, the Celtics were in 11th place in the Eastern Conference at 18 and 21. I mean, this team is the most resilient team. You just mentioned all the teams they had to go through the road to the championship here. They were at their ultimate low there on January 6th. They've just grinded their way back. They're so resilient. And Warriors, clearly the better team top to bottom. But this is why you play the game. And I just think this one probably goes six or seven games. The Celtics are 6-0 and following a loss in the playoffs. And they're 3-0 and in elimination games. So they get you down to the wire, and then they just hang on. They scratch and claw. Going to be a lot of fun. Thursday is game one, 8 p.m. tip-off. I think that was on TNT. All right, Reggie, you survived the gauntlet once again. We're back here tomorrow breaking down more Twins, Vikings, NBA, and NHL playoffs, and plenty more. Remember to like, rate, review, and subscribe to our YouTube channel. Join us every day for another episode covering all the biggest topics in Minnesota sports. He's Reggie Wilson. Follow him on Twitter at ReggieWilsonTV and on CARE11. I'm Luke Inman on Twitter at Luke underscore Spinman. Tune in tomorrow to Superior Sports Talk, part of Locked On Sports Minnesota. For Reggie, I'm Luke. Until tomorrow, signing out. Be blessed. Spread love today. This is Superior Sports Talk with Reggie Wilson and Luke Inman, part of Locked On Sports Minnesota.